Oh, we're for our next installment from the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium, but from home <laughs> with Bobby Farley's Rubio. We're doing um, What's Up Tonight Skies. And uh, again, next week, it'll only be on Thursdays, not our regular Tuesday, Thursday, but we'll be switching just to Thursdays. So I'll hand it over, Bobby, and let, take us away on the night sky. <laughs> Well, thank you, Leela, and uh, I hope the skies are clear. It's going to be kind of cold, and it might even snow this weekend, but I want to talk about something that I guarantee you'll probably see peeking through the clouds tonight. It's a full moon, um, and this full moon is the one that's known by convention, uh, through, thanks to the old Farmer's Almanac, uh, which has been around since 1792. They use dates, uh, for, I mean, names for the moon that go back to the colonial period in America, and they're kind of a hybrid between Native American folklore and uh, colonial European folklore, you know, that was brought here uh, to the New World. So the the moon that we're going to be having tonight is known as the Flower Moon, and you you don't need me to tell you all that. A lot of stuff is blooming outside. This is exactly the right time for the full flower moon. So let's go to Stellarium, and we can see what the moon's going to look like. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the funny tricks the moon can pull when it's full, like a lunar eclipse, which unfortunately is not going to be happening anytime soon. But I thought I would use this opportunity to talk about that. But first, if you haven't used Stellarium, you should go to stellarium.org and get this software, which I have set up to show us what today is going to look like. And outside is starting to catch up with this uh, scenery that's built into Stellarium. Uh, we don't have our leaves on our trees yet, but we do have a lot of green grass growing outside under the full flower moon. So I hit the L key and you can look down and see the time is fast forwarding. That's how you can use the keyboard as a shortcut. And I'm going to make the sunset and tonight's sunset is going to be at eight o'clock exactly, but that depends on having a level horizon. And most of us in Vermont do not have anything even close to a level horizon. But here we are around 7.30, you can see the twilight, but I think we want to talk about the moon. And notice that the moon is not visible yet, but one of the definitions of a full moon, and maybe this would be best to see if I zoom out, uh, is that it's always exactly on the opposite side of the sky from the sun. So let's use Stellarium to kind of uh, throw ourselves down into a well where we can see east and west at the same time. And I'm gonna take the ground out of the picture you can see where the sun is and you can see where the moon is. They're on opposite sides of the sky. And so as time goes on and the sun begins to set, the moon will begin to rise at almost exactly that same time. That is a full moon property. That's one of the things that makes it a full moon. It's 180 degrees away from where the sun is. And that's why the full face of the moon is illuminated to us. But that also means that the full moon will be out the entire night. So it's a full night of moon, it's a full face of moon, and it's a fully opposite from where the sun is in the sky. So let's continue. By the way, if you're wondering what that bright light, I, light is, if you haven't been watching our broadcast, that's Venus that's been in the sky for several weeks. I hope you recognize her by now, but let's move on to a little bit later. Now that the sun is disappearing, there's our last views of Sirius there in the southwest you'll see that on the opposite side of the sky, the moon, oh, there you are, is just rising. So let's give ourselves a more flattened view, standing far away. In Stellarium, they keep the moon to the accurate scale, which means it's hard to see how it you know, looks in phase, but you can always zoom in and then get the full effect this way. And there's the full moon right now. So. When the full moon is out, it's kind of tricky to notice the constellations that are nearby. Uh, it's just so bright that it's sort of overwhelming. But if you've been watching our broadcast before, you may remember we talked a lot about the constellation Virgo and its association with the goddess of flowers, Persephone, to the ancient Greeks. Well, here is Spica, the brightest star of Virgo. And even though the full moon makes it difficult to see, if you look carefully, you might see her eyes here, her chin, their little triangular face, her long arms, her shoulders, her waist, and her long legs stretching out above Spica. And Spica represents a flower that may have fallen from one of her hands. And if you see what I'm tracing here, you might see that familiar constellation, Virgo, but she's the goddess of flowers. And the, the full flower moon just passed right by Spica 
uh, you know, last night you might have seen the moon and thought it was full too. I'm, I'm not going to be too picky. The full moon is precisely one night, but in reality, by perception, there's actually three nights that the moon looks full to us. So I'm not one of those fussy people that say, no, it's actually tomorrow night that it's a full moon. If you think it looks like it's a full moon, as far as I'm concerned, you're right. But technically, tonight is the full moon. But let's go back in time to last night, just for a second. And then you can see the moon was right here. And another night ago, the moon was right next to Spica. So this is not something that's unusual. This happens every single year in the spring. Right before the full flower moon, the moon cruises right by Virgo, the goddess of flowers. So if you are, you know, superstitious or if you like ancient mythology, this is pretty auspicious. It's a nice thing to see happening in the sky. And that's what you would have seen last night and the night before. But tonight, you can see that the moon is far below where she is hanging out in the constellation Libra. And Libra is made of such faint stars that because the full moon is going to be there, you're not going to really see much of Libra's stars. I'll, I'll spend some more time talking about that constellation on a future episode, Libra, because it's not quite easy to see right now. But the moon. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the things that the moon does, because over the last few years, there's been a new popular term to describe a full moon as a super moon. And this is a super moon. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that the moon is putting on a red cape and, you know, leaping to rescue people in Metropolis. That is not what supermoon means. What supermoon means is that the moon is actually in a particularly close position when it's full. And this might surprise you because maybe you think that the moon is always the same distance from the Earth. But I have a really cool video that you can download for free at NASA's website. There's a website that all educators out there should know about. It's the Science Visualization Studio. It's run out of Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, and they have amazing videos that you can download and use because NASA, everything NASA makes is public domain. You can use them as much as you'd like. And I'm going to switch from Stellarium right now to one of these very handy videos that I use on a regular basis. So let's see. Let's get this one loaded up. They, every year, usually a few months before the year changes, they create a moon phase video that shows you every phase of the moon for the entire calendar year that's coming. And I'm going to show that to you now. For this year, 2020, I've got it preloaded for tonight's full moon. And you can see down here all this information, the date and the phase that will be 99.6. I'm really close, but I could probably scooch it a little farther there to get all the way to keep it 100. Oh, I can't even get to 100. Look at that. So, but you see how this precise this is as a video. And it tells you the actual distance of the moon from the Earth. And I don't want to get into the actual kilometers. I want to maybe make it a little simpler with this background part of the video. You can see on the left-hand side the Earth and this white line that goes behind the moon to where it says 28, 30, and 32. That is in reference to Earth diameters. So the Earth is roughly 8,000 miles wide, 28 times 8 thousand versus 32 times 8,000. So you can see that there is a fair several thousand mile difference between when the moon is closest and when the moon is farthest. And this full moon is going to happen when the moon is almost as close as it can be. And if I press play on this video, you're going to see that I hope this comes through clearly. I might stop it. By the time the moon gets to this waning gibbous phase, it'll be a bit farther away about 16,000 miles farther away than it is tonight. It's pretty crazy to think that. And then when the moon gets to be this little waning crescent phase, it'll be at about its farthest distance, another 16,000 miles away from the Earth. So about 32,000 miles farther now, or it's closer that, that by that distance now than it will be when it's getting close to a new moon. But this changes that close distance the uh, perigee is what it's called, and the far distance, the apogee, there they don't always line up with the phases perfectly. So sometimes you have the full moon happening when it's farthest away, and then the full moon will actually look smaller. And then you might have the, the new moon happening when it's uh, you know closer, but it doesn't always work out that the full moon is at that uh, perigee position. I don't want to get too technical with all these terms, 
So not every full moon is a super moon. Not every full moon is that close to the Earth. Sometimes when the moon is that close, it'll be a new moon and you won't be seeing it. But this moon tonight will be about 10% bigger than the average full moon and about 15% brighter. And I don't want to get into all the physics like Veen's law that explains why that difference in percentages, but the moon will be extra bright, extra big, superb, and you can sit next to your daffodils or your forsythia or your rose daphne or the trilliums or whatever else is blooming in your woods and see the flower moon tonight. And the good thing about the full moon is that you don't need perfect weather to enjoy it. Even if there's partial clouds, you can still see it peeking through the clouds. And even if it's totally cloudy, um, the sky will be so bright from the light of the full moon that you can probably still walk around even without a flashlight. So take advantage of this full moon uh howl at it if you'd like but i also want to talk about something that can happen more occasionally not every moon not every 29 and a half days but more uh, infrequently i'm talking about a lunar eclipse or what some folks have now started calling blood moons <laughs> now this tonight's not going to be a lunar eclipse i want to be clear in fact the next lunar eclipse that we have a chance of seeing is on june 5th the night around midnight between June 5th and June 6th. But the bummer about this year is that all of the lunar eclipses are going to be penumbral. Okay, sorry, another big uh, term there. But penumbra, it refers to the shadow of the Earth, and I'll show you exactly what I mean. But when there's a penumbral lunar eclipse, it's not that dark. The moon dims by just a small percentage. When you have a full or an umbral lunar eclipse, one that everyone sees as completely dark. The moon gets so dark, and then it starts to glow red. But the red part, I'll explain in a moment. But if you want to know how this works, there's another video that NASA has produced already uh, from their science visualization studio. This one's been around for a while, and I've been using it for many years, teaching kids all about the lunar uh, eclipses, long before they started calling them blood moons, actually. Let's see if I can hold on a second. This was made by the folks that work on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and they actually used images from a satellite that we currently have orbiting the moon, a satellite with, with such precise cameras that it's actually been able to see the footsteps of the astronauts that walked on the moon 50 years ago. But I want to go fast forward through this real quick. All right, here's the terminology that I want you to know. The penumbra is that part of the Earth's shadow in which the sunlight is only partially obscured. And... Partially obscured. Oh, well, sorry, the guy just said the same thing I did. <laughs> I've seen this video too many times, I probably got the words memorized. But the penumbra's here, and this is what you might see during the lunar eclipse coming on June 5th and 6th. About 10% dimmer. Eh, you're probably not gonna notice. And it happens around midnight, so you probably are not gonna even be up and if you do happen to be up, it's not going to be so obvious. You, you'd have to be very observant to see that. But if the moon actually slips into the umbra, that's when we get that blood moon effect. Now, the blood moon is, it has nothing to do with blood. So for my, our younger viewers, do not worry. There is no sacrificing of any animals that happens during the blood moon. There is nothing strange about it. It's actually based on something that's very cool that happens with the Earth's atmosphere. Now, the, let me... Let me put it in a different way. The red light that you're seeing is almost always shining on the full moon, but there's other colors shining on the full moon too. The whole entire spectrum from the sun is usually shining on the full moon. So the red is overpowered by all of the other light that the sun puts on it. But if the moon slips into the earth's shadow, then no sunlight can directly reach the moon. This you might expect would make the moon go pitch black, completely dark. And that would happen, except for the fact that our planet has an atmosphere. So the reason why the moon looks red, to make a long story short, is exactly the same reason why before you can see the sun in the morning, the sky can look red. And after the sun sets in the evening, after the sun is directly out of sight, think about this, you are not seeing the sun anymore if the sun just dipped below the mountains. The sun is out of sight, but the light of the sun is still reaching you somehow because of the Earth's atmosphere. 
the atmosphere is conducting, transmitting, reflecting and refracting that light of the sun. And since the atmosphere is made up of all these gases, it glows even after the sun is out of sight. And let me show you a little bit of what that video can show you. See, when the atmosphere of the earth has sunlight going through it, in part, especially near the horizon when the sun is setting or the sun is rising, just to visualize yourself near where those rainbows appear in this picture. If you were standing on the top one, you would be standing on the part of the earth that's about to watch the sun rise. That, that would be the east, you know. And uh, if you were standing on the bottom rainbow or near that, you would be watching the sun after it just set. And notice that both of them have this red color directly overhead. That is caused by the same effect that causes light to refract into the rainbow, the spectrum. By the way, the spectrum that Sir Isaac Newton discovered and figured out how to name during a plague in the 1600s in England when he was uh, uh, quarantined at home in a, a country house trying to stay away from the illness and self-isolating, social distancing himself back then. And that time gave him the time to think about how the spectrum worked. And he picked the name spectrum based on the word specter for a ghost. So as a part of the history of the rainbow here, but notice how the rainbow uh, radiates out from the, those refraction points at the limb of the earth where the sun is going through the atmosphere. And you notice that the red bends at just the right angle. So most of the red light hits the moon and the blue and the green, the yellow, the other colors scatter away from the moon. This is all connected to why the sky is blue and all that, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. But notice there's no blood in this picture. So all of this redness that you see on the moon is caused directly by the Earth's atmosphere filtering and refracting and bending the path of the light from the sun hitting the moon. And if the moon were out in the sun too, like it is normally during a full moon, because it's usually above the umbra or below the umbra, but not in the umbra, then you don't see that red light because the sunlight is also there and it just overpowers this little faint effect. So you can only see this when the moon is completely in the Earth's shadow, a lunar eclipse all my life until maybe, I don't know, Leela, what do you think? It's been five or 10 years ago that people started calling them blood moons, maybe because of the internet, hashtag blood moon. I don't know. It's a new name, relatively speaking, in popular culture, but this is nothing new. This phenomenon has been around uh, as long as humans have been looking at the sky and longer. So I hope you catch a lunar eclipse soon, but none of these blood moons are going to happen this year. Boo. However, that doesn't mean you can't enjoy the beautiful full flower moon that you're going to be ha having uh, tonight. Uh, and oh, well, well, before we go, I know it's time is almost up. I'm just going to add one more thing. I'm going to show you a picture from the old farmer's almanac of the different names of the phases of the moon. This might be fun for you to copy somehow. You can find it on their website, of course. And maybe you can, uh, those of you crafty folks at home, I know there's a cool kind of quilt pattern called the moon over the mountain. Maybe you can make a quilt with 12 moons on it and each one can reflect one of these different phases. So we've got the full wolf moon of January. I'm back to wolf baby, you hear them howling. And then the full snow moon. I wonder why they call it that in February. And then you have in March the full worm moon, which think about how the ground is thawing and the mud is oozing and the worms are crawling. And then the full pink moon, which was last month. And that one refers to not a color, unlike this picture, unfortunately, but it's actually uh, flowers like a Deptford pink and uh, phlox that bloom at this time. And then the full flower moon, the one we're having now. And coming up next, the full strawberry moon. I'm very eagerly anticipating that. And the full buck moon, and that refers to the antlers on deer, which are at full growth during that time in July. And then the full sturgeon moon for August. And I will mention that a little bit more uh, in our next future broadcast because the sturgeon is a creature that lives in Lake Champlain alongside, at least by legend, another creature of similar shape and size, but even bigger, the creature known as Champ may have a connection to the sturgeon, maybe, or definitely uh, the full sturgeon moon. Now, sturgeon are bottom feeder fish, so they rarely come to the surface. So the only time when fishermen in ancient times and modern times could catch sturgeon is when they come to the surface to mate. So there is a real strong connection with 
year and that full moon in August. And then the full corn moon for the next month, also known as the harvest moon. Bust out your Neil Young records. That's the famous harvest moon. And then the full hunter's moon, which is perfectly coinciding with our hunting seasons. The full beaver moon, which refers to the behaviors of our biggest rodent and their preparations for winter when they get ready to uh, you know, social uh, distance themselves and hide in their uh, the lodges and eat sticks instead of going out to get wood. And then finally, to end this, the December full cold moon. Hmm, I wonder why they call it that. Well, some of these moon names are fun. They're a combination of European and Native American folklore. And I wish I could trace down the exact names. There's lots of alternate names. If you go to different cultures, you'll hear different names for the moon. But without a doubt, the full moon is one of the most important things that humans have been observing in the sky. It's how we mark time. And I hope you've enjoyed the time you spent watching this uh, broadcast about the sky. I hope you get to see that full moon and many other moons for many moons into the future. So now, Leela, I think that's about the end. Did any questions come in from our- uh... No, I didn't. We have an attendee, but I didn't see any questions. So, um, but I just wanted to say, I'm very excited about the strawberry moon because I've, I've even seen a few strawberry flowers out in my yard, just teeny tiny, but uh, getting excited. So I can see by next month <laughs> or month, I will get to have strawberries. So awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing that information. It's very helpful and, and I'm excited hopefully for tonight to see a little full moon action with uh, our clear skies <laughs> we'll go for a walk under the flower moon and absolutely the all right we'll take so, care and of again we'll, we'll be next thursday and, and um and not next tuesday but just next thursday we'll do this at uh, 2 30 again so please join us at that time and um thank you so much again bobby for all your awesome information and we'll see you next week <laughs> thanks bye bye